Hi, this is Julia Whittup with Talk Story TV, and we have with us today Robert Rosen, who has written a memoir and investigative report, and I'll let him tell us more about what it's about. Okay, well, my book is called Beaver Street, A History of Modern Pornography. Uh, it was published recently in the U.S. by Head Press, which is... Uh, a small independent publisher in London, and uh, it's a combination, as you said, of memoir and investigative journalism. Um, I had worked in the pornography business for many years, for 16 years as a magazine editor beginning in 1983, and pretty much from my first day on the job, I realized that I was seeing things that were both absurd and shocking. And I also realized that the kind of things I had been seeing had never been written about before. So I've been keeping a diary since 1977. And um, I just started taking detailed notes on in my diary on all the stuff that was going on. And I knew pretty much from the first day that this was going to be the basis for uh, a book. I didn't realize I was going to be working in the industry that long, you know, not for 16 years. I thought, you know, maybe a year, but, you know, it just kept going on and on. And, uh, you know, it's a combination, an insider account of what was going on in the porn industry, beginning with the age of the computer. And then I just kind of, you know, hooked that up with straightforward research and uh, investigative journalism and the end result is a book that reads like uh, a comic novel, though it's actually, you know, a very serious political history, cultural history. So you were in the industry when Larry Flynn had his whole situation. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, well, the first magazine I worked for was High Society, and the reason I got hired, I got hired in 1983 when the previous Great Recession was going on, the recession under Ronald Reagan. And at the time that I got hired, I was just like an out-of-work writer-editor who was looking for work. And there were 10 million people unemployed at the time, and I would go through the newspaper every Sunday when they had the big classified section. They still printed newspapers in those days, and people still read printed newspapers. Um, I would go through the health wanted looking for, you know, any kind of job. And then one day, all of a sudden, like magic, all these jobs started popping up for editors, writers. And the New York Times didn't use the word porn mag. The euphemism that they used was men's sophisticate. And I knew what that was. And I sent in my resume. And I got hired as an associate editor by High Society Magazine. What had happened is they had just invented this thing called phone sex. And what that was, was when the uh, AT&T Corporation was broken up, all these 976 lines that had been used for things like dial of prayer and sports score and horoscopes. For the first time, according to the new law, these 976 lines had to be turned over to, to private companies. And... High Society Magazine managed to get 3976 lines, and what they did was convert them to phone sex. And people would call this 976 number, and each time somebody called, the phone company would make 7 cents, and the publisher would make 2 cents. And on these phone sex lines, High Society started getting a half million calls per day, which came out to an additional like $70,000 per week for the publisher. And that was like probably the only example of trickle-down economics that actually worked. All this money started trickling down, and High Society, who was the first company to come up with the phone sex idea, started hiring people. So I was hired on phone sex money as an editor and a writer of phone sex scripts. And uh, that was how the whole thing started. And I was just, it was, you know, They're working on a script? Yeah, they hired professional actresses to read these one-minute phone sex scripts. And 
you know, these were struggling actresses who, you know, if they were lucky, would get a part in some off-Broadway play. They started paying them $1,000 per day to read phone sex scripts. So, you know, I was making money at my new job. They were making money reading dirty scripts. And a half a million people per day were calling this phone number. And it turned out one of the best customers was the Pentagon, that there was this cartoon. <laughs> there was this cartoon in the New York Post, you know, showing these Pentagon generals in the war room with High Society magazine calling the phone sex line. And it just became this cultural phenomenon. And people started making a fortune, and it eventually spread throughout the entire industry. And this was the first time. Uh, this was the first time that computer technology was fused with pornography. And, and now it's one of the biggest industries on the internet, isn't it? Um, well, you know, industry is a funny word. That when the internet finally took over, you know, people used to spend a lot of money on magazines, and going back to like. 1995, 1996, that was when the Internet first started really taking over. And um, people realized that there was all this free pornography available on the Internet, videos, pictures, whatnot. And it was better quality stuff than they were paying a fortune for in the magazine. So uh, slowly but surely, this thing that in 1983 magazine publishers were making a fortune on, which was phone sex, by 1995, when the whole world figured out that she could get porno for free, it started putting them out of business. And now the industry, well, you know, for over 10 years now, almost 15 years, the industry has been in a state of collapse. Oh, it is? Yes. Yeah, that, you know, people aren't making money. That, okay, the question now is, you know, they got these sites called New Porn where anybody can make a porno video with, you know, a little video camera and, uh, you know, they buy a camera for $150 and 24 hours later, them and their girlfriend are porn stars and they do it for free. They put these really good porno videos on the Internet for free. And the question that the industry, both magazines and the big video companies cannot answer is how do you compete with people who are, are, are giving away the product for free when you sell it? And the answer is you really can't. So, you know, this has been going on for years, and the industry is in a state of collapse. Huh. I had no idea. I thought they were all charging. Well, there are people charging, and there are certain things that you can get if you pay for it, but most people know you don't really have to pay for it. It's all out there for free because there's all these people who just, they want to be porno stars. They do it because they're exhibitionists. And, uh, you know, when you, <laughs> when you get off the computer with me, if you start doing some searching on Google, you will find out that there is all this pornography out there for free, go to a site like uh, YouPorn or Pornhub, and, you know, there's good stuff out there for free, and that's all there is to it. And if you're trying to make money off it, you can't. Well, mm -hmm. you know, you can. People still are, but it's very, very difficult. So what were some of the most shocking things you found out about? Where are we most shocking in? Well, I'm not really sure I should be talking about some of the most shocking things. I mean, you know, this is not an X-rated program, is it? Oh, true. No, it isn't. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I, mean, I okay, guess I thought like some it. of them would be scandals involving um, politicians and... Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I see what you're getting at. You're not talking about some of the most... Okay, what happened in 1986 was that Ronald Reagan's attorney general, Edwin Meese, who uh, eventually had to resign from office in disgrace because he got caught doing all these incredibly corrupt things from like garden varieties uh, kind of things like steering contracts to his 
steering uh, government contracts to his business cronies to um, suborning perjury in the case of the Iran-Contra scandal, which he was into up to his neck, uh, he decided to form a committee to investigate the porno industry because he felt that pornography was like the communist menace and it was destroying American values or something like that. And, you know, obviously the man was a total hypocrite, but he, he put together this committee that was essentially composed of all these right-wing conservative Republicans and uh, Christian types, and, you know, everybody on the committee was out to get porn. So, um, you know, they had all these people testify in Washington, including a few porn stars, but, you know, mostly people who said that their lives had been ruined by pornography. And they eventually put out a report, you know, just saying that pornography was destroying American values and they had, you know, all these recommendations to put pornography out of business, uh, you know, charge them under organized crime statutes and things like that. Uh, they said that most pornography in America had to do with child pornography, bestiality, things like that, which was patently false, but like everything that they were investigating, you know, they found the most deranged and sordid things, and they investigated that. Now, what was happening simultaneously was, at the time, there was a porn star whose, whose name is Tracy Lords, and she's now kind of a straightforward B-movie Hollywood star. Um, at the time, she was the most popular star in the porno industry. She was, the, you know, she was in a few hundred videos. She was on the cover of, like, every magazine. She was, like, just constantly working, constantly being shot. Simultaneously with the release of the Mies Commission report, Tracy Lords came forward, turned herself into the FBI, and said that for in her entire career, for three years, it had gone on for three years, that she was underage for every single thing that she'd ever done, that she started out as a 15-year-old runaway, and she worked nonstop for three years. In this entire time, there was virtually not one porn magazine that was printed that did not contain at least one picture of Tracy Lords. Everything that was about to go to press at the time had, you know, pictorials about Tracy Lords, all these videos for sale, in production. They starred Tracy Lords. She was just an incredibly popular young woman, possibly the most popular porn star who, um, who, who ever worked at that time. It was as if she waved a magic wand and all of a sudden, everything that the porno industry had been producing for three years was now child pornography, except nobody thought that Tracy Lords was um, an underage woman, that, you know, she had gone to incredible lengths to get a phony birth certificate, phony passport, phony driver's license. She was telling people she was 21 years old when she was 15. She had the identification to prove it. She was absolutely beautiful. She was absolutely willing to do virtually everything. And um, she got hired all the time. What happened was all these videos she was in, every magazine that was ever published, um, it all had to be pulped, just, 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 um, destroyed, because, you know, it was now illegal child pornography. What finally came out, what I talk about in my book, is that the FBI knew about Tracy Lords for an entire year before she came forward. And they, knowing that she was underage, they allowed her to continue working so they could gather evidence on the pornographers. Now, it just seemed extremely hypocritical and outrageous that even though the FBI was using this underage woman as a, a, 
on in what was essentially a sting operation. They had no problem with that, but the people in the porno industry who were you know, hiring her all the time didn't know she was underage, but all these people were arrested and you know, charged, with, charged with child exploitation and so forth. Long story short, as they say, everybody who was uh, arrested for exploiting Tracy Lords was uh, eventually the charges were dropped because, you know, she um, had ID that proved she was of, of legal age. The only person who was actually convicted was this one video company president, Ruben Gottesman, who, who um, even after it became known that Tracy Lords was underage, he had tried to sell some Tracy Lords videos to an undercover cop, and, you know, he was arrested, he was convicted, he went to jail for, like, one year, got charged, um, got fined $100,000, and, uh, you know, everybody else, you know, it was just the government doing what they could to destroy the porno industry, but instead, the whole thing backfired, and it just, like, brought the porno industry the kind of publicity that, you know, money couldn't buy. This stuff was on the front page of all the newspapers, and instead of putting pornographers out of um, business, it increased sales dramatically. And uh, that was Tracy Lord's story, and that is the story, at the one of the stories at the heart of Beaver Street. And um, I go back and I talk about how not only Edwin Neese was corrupt, but also the four greatest porn warriors, um, you know, anti-porn warriors of the 20th century, uh, you know, Edwin Meese, who I just spoke about, Richard Nixon, who I'm sure you know about, Spiro Agnew, and Charles Keating, who was at the heart of the savings and loans um, scandal. They were all staunch anti-porn warriors who were all involved in incredibly corrupt activities mm-hmm. and were resigned their positions in, dis- uh, in disgrace to avoid prosecution except for Keating, who was actually convicted of multiple felonies and went to jail. And I say in Beaver Street, you know, why is it that the people who cry ban pornography the loudest are always the biggest crooks? And, uh, you know, that's a legitimate point that I raised. All right. Wow, that sounds like an interesting book. How many pages is it? Uh, well, you know, here's Beaver Street. Oh, okay. uh, it is uh, 214 pages. 214, okay. And where could someone get the book if they want to uh, purchase it? Pretty much, uh, pretty much anywhere. It's available on Amazon as both a paperback and a Kindle. It's available in all ebook formats. Uh, you know, Amazon. On Barnes and Noble too, a lot of uh, independent bookstores like Powell's in Oregon and Book Soup in Los Angeles carry it. Um, McNally Jackson in New York, uh, also Shakespeare's in New York. Uh, you know, pretty much anywhere books are sold, you can get Beaver Street. Okay, all right. And do you have a website? Yeah, it's. Um, RobertRosenNYC.com, everything you want to know about Beaver Street or my first book, a John Lennon biography called Nowhere Man, is available there. And, uh, you know, there's a blog. I update it very frequently. And uh, my next live appearance is going to be at the Book House in Albany, New York, on September 14th, Thursday, September 14th. Uh, You can get the information for that on my website, and um, I guess that's about it. Okay. Well, we hope you'll be in the chat room when we broadcast your show, and you can, uh, yeah, there's a chat room on the broadcast page, and uh, viewers can ask questions, and the schedule... The schedule for that is uh, at TalkStoryTV.com. And uh, so if you have any questions for Robert Rosen about his book, Beaver Street, we encourage you to uh, 
check out the schedule and come to the broadcast. Okay, sounds great. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for being with us. Okay.